Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Mosier, and I work at the UCLA Library Preservation and Conservation Department. Um, and I'm part of the Los Angeles Preservation Network, or LAPNET. Um, so I'm just briefly going to introduce LAPNET and our two speakers for this session. Um, and I'll also be helping with questions at the end. Uh, so LAPNET was established in January 1987 to meet some of the preservation needs of librarians, archivists, conservators and records managers um, working in the LA city um, and county. Um, we were actually formed in response to the fire at the Los Angeles Public Library in 1986. Um, and we put on uh, workshops and other programming, mainly for library professionals in the LA area, focused on um, all different aspects of library preservation. Um, and at the end of the month, we actually have um, a panel that we're hosting about how different libraries in the LA area are um, responding to COVID-19 and um, kind of some of their reopening plans. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about that and um, our other events, you can find us at lapnet.org. Um, let's see. Do we have the intro slide up? Okay. Yeah, next slide. Um, so our two presenters will be discussing how to care for your books at home, um, including an introduction to book structure, book handling, um, some storage tips and assessment, and uh, much more. Ron Matson has been the bindery prep and repair coordinator at UC Irvine Library for 26 years, and he's been a member of LAPNAD for 10 years. And Will Lin is the collections conservator with the UCLA Library, and he's been with the conservation department at UCLA since its very beginning. Um, and I was lucky enough that he offered me a job way back when I was a grad student. Um, and he has been um, an invaluable colleague ever since. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Ron. Hey everybody, how are you today? My name is Ron from UC Irvine. I can't see the slides, okay. We're going to talk about book, book structure today. And the first thing we're going to do is we have some slides, but I thought that I would do um, something where you can actually visually see. Visually see. This is my mom's, uh, uh, what is it? The Good, Keep, Good Housekeeping Cookbook. Um, this is an invaluable uh, treasure um, in my family for us, uh, just for me. It's just a plain old book. It's the fourth or fifth edition, but I love it. And I thought I would show it today. So we're going to talk book structure. So what we have here is we have our spine and then right here we have our outer hinges or what we call gutter. You can see this here. Now most of all of our wear and tear and stress in the book is going to occur um, on, in this area right here. Uh, also on the inside we have our end papers right here and we have more end papers. Our, in sheets, excuse me. And you can see here that this book has actually been repaired. Uh, you can see the corners have been redone here. Um, it still has some other issues, but I just wanted to be able to use it uh, sometimes when um, I'm cooking or whatever and want them, something that reminds me of my mom. Anyways, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> next slide. <clears throat> and next slide, thank you very much. Okay, some really good stuff. Book handling at home or anywhere. Uh, dues, uh, store materials in environment around 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Avoid areas with uh, temperature uh, and relative humidity fluctuations. What I highly recommend you do is you can buy a nice little uh, thermometer for 10 bucks on Amazon. And what I would do is I would store this in the area where you're thinking of housing uh, your intrinsic item in your house or whatever. And um, just because the temperature is nice at one point during the day, doesn't mean at another point in the day that your temperatures will change um, in, in varying difference, you wouldn't, you'd be amazed. Um, the other things you wanna do is keep your items away from direct sunlight and storage uh, on exterior walls of structure and or near radiators and vents, meaning the exterior walls of your structure, wherever you are, uh, they winter time, those walls get cold. 
summertime they get extra hot so right there you're going to have a bunch of fluctuations in temp and then near radiators vents near your bathroom where there's steam coming out you maybe have a closet that's next to your bathroom and you think oh it's great because it's got a door on it but guess what all that uh um humidity is going to seep out and possibly disturb whatever materials that you're storing in the closet uh store your books upright meaning upright like this or you can do it the really great way is storing them on their spine here and this way there's no weight whatsoever and what i talked about earlier was the hinges all of your weight and i'm not even going to try it is your weight is going to go in this area so if it's on its spine no weight no gravity is going to hurt it then you want to use bookmarks when you're reading to save your your space and or you want to write notes on your bookmarks you're not really going to want to write inside your books i mean you can it's your book uh if you're going to write um on a piece of paper your notes like i was saying with the bookmark don't actually write with the bookmark that's actually on don't write use your book or item as something to write on write it separately because you can leave uh indentation from your pen or after effects or uh bleeding uh i just said write notes on a separate piece of paper this is a great one i can't stress this enough uh, which is wash your hands before and after using your um, items, whatever you're looking at, because we have oil and we have um, salt and whatnot on our fingers, and that's gonna uh, permeate into our books or anything organic that we're working on. And something you really would like, if you're really worried, whatever, use a pair of clean cotton gloves for your most valuable items. Just do the glove thing, and then you're gonna be set. And then this is the biggest one, really. This is the biggest no-no, and we all suffer from it, is keep food and drink at arm's length, at least away from books. Now, I'm sure a lot of people in this room are to be like, wait a minute, it's with near your books or whatever. Technically, you shouldn't have any food or drink near your books whatsoever, but I'm just kind of trying to be realistic because we're at home. Next slide. Okay, book handling the don'ts don't use post-it notes uh, you can use your post-it notes just don't stick the post-it notes onto your book or pages because what can happen is the post-it note actually will lift possibly lift up ink or other artifacts or even paper if it's a brittle book and you'll damage the book that way paper clips even if the paper clips are galvanized or whatever they're still going to possibly leave indentations rust uh, puncture points you name it i've seen it don't use tape meaning scotch tape that kind of things will's going to talk about that a little bit later we're not saying don't use tape at all but you just need to be mindful of what you're going to do and the consequences and rubber bands are terrible because they degrade and get brittle next up would be folding or dog earing as we say in our profession pages to mark where you are especially with older books if you do a dog ear on a book this might even be you can see my mom's example hopefully these have been just folded in the back but what can happen is these dog ears will be brittle and they will just actually just fall right off they will actually break off next thing would be uh writing or highlighting in a book obviously it's your book but if you have something extremely valuable don't want to do that unless it's an autograph or something from the author or something and you can prove the i think the words providence provenance excuse me uh of that don't do any of that just do yourself a favor but like i said it's your own item you can decide what you want to do using your book as a writing platform which as i just discussed a moment ago is actually writing a note on a piece of paper on top of a book or whatever you'll be able to see whatever you wrote forever uh at a later date and you probably don't want that another item is a uh, simple one is uh Forcing a book open uh, to 180 degrees or more. Uh, this happens especially with brand new books. You get your art book home, you just, you paid your $100 for it, you love it, you get home and you open it to the middle and you slam it down, you know, and you're like, wow, and then you pop the spine. What you wanna do is you wanna do something where you're opening, say maybe every 20, 30 pages, gently opening, kind of maybe even uh, creasing through the, the sp uh, hinge area and that way it'll kind of give a chance to uh, i guess you'd be like a gently break in your book and another huge one i can't tell you enough unless you absolutely have to i personally do not and this is from experience don't 
store your items in a garage, attic, or basement. It just really goes back to those fluctuations uh, in temperatures and our age. We don't have um, insulation as well in our, like my garage gets to be 120 degrees in the summer um, and things, anything like that are gonna degrade quickly. If you have something in a basement, uh, hey, that's great. But then if you have a hot water heater down there and hot water heater breaks, then you have that, that to deal with. And next you want to um, remember, any physical alteration to items will change intrinsic uh, monetary value of your item. Uh, so just remembering if you're trying to tape or you're trying to do whatever, um, that is actually going to change the value if you're going to sell it at a later date or you just want to keep it preserved in its original condition. And finally, keep all materials uh, away from children <laughs> or pets, meaning you can leave something down a little bit, I like call it like low hanging fruit, uh, leave it on your coffee table, a dog smells some sort of uh, organic materials in the item and they will possibly chew on it. I had that happen in my seventh grade yearbook, which I promptly cried for probably about half a day. I don't know why, but it was important at the time. And children, especially not older children, children that are teething. I've had that happen with my kids uh, gnawing on the edges because they're teething and you know that's okay with their books, but maybe uh, your special books, you don't want that to happen. Next slide. <clears throat> books can fall apart due to poor uh, usage or handling. Food and drink for the wind. Every time, that's the number one mistake we all make. Can't stress that enough. Improperly pulling uh, books off of shelves where you're wondering, how do you pull a book off of the shelf? It's pretty easy. You would take your hand like this and you can just pull it out like this. You never want to go to the top of the spine and tip it towards you. You're going to see a slide in a minute. It'll show you damage as a result. What I like to do, I don't know why, I think because I'm always afraid I'm going to hurt this, I will actually reach to the back of the book and I will gently tip it towards myself and then pull it off the shelf. <clears throat> the higher the books or your items are stored, the longer they will fall. I've seen an item that's 100, 120 years old fall from a six inch shelf, a bottom shelf of a book truck and actually explode on site. Uh, I think we all see that. So if you have something up high, just remember it can also fall. Transportation. Uh, this is something new actually that I, when I was doing this, working on this project, um, place your items. Uh, and I, my opinion is you want to, I would, if you're going on a trip, Put them flat in a bag or whatever with nothing else in the bag, such as sunblock, your essential oils, your whatever makeup, whatever it is that can get, uh, that possibly can spill on there. I've left um, sunblock, the spray where it has a lock system and I forgot to lock it and then something's pressed on it and it sprayed everything in the bag and uh, can ruin everything. Uh, improperly opening books, we discussed that. And here's, this is a real simple one. You have a number one issue of Walking Dead. It's worth a fortune. It's first edition. You got it the first month it came out or whatever. And you love reading it. You want to show your friends, but you got it graded and you have it in a nice storage case. And here's all you do. Just buy a reprint of that, that issue. And then you can show it to your, a copy of it to your friends. You don't have to do the, no, 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 don't touch it. What are you going to do? Just like they could do whatever with the reprint and it'll make you happy too. Next slide. Simple uh, shelving mistakes that we've all seen. Here we have uh, smash pages, improper shelving. You're shelving wherever it was. It was too low and you just decide, oh, I don't want to deal with this and you shove it in. Well, you could just set the book flat instead of storing it upright. Simple solution or find another area for the item. This is a smashed enclosure in the middle here. The enclosure did its job, but it's been uh, <clears throat> run over. Um, I think it's also been shoved too hard into shelving. And then here on the right, this is an example. Uh, and this is like, this is probably a 15 to 30 minute repair right here. And it probably took about one second to make this tear. And that's like I was said, as you were pulling that book directly at the top of the spine and it popped off. Next slide. 
And these are just examples of normal wear and tear. You're going to get items that are just going to be falling apart. Or the way I am, uh, you know, we like to see books that are well, well used because that means that patrons enjoyed them and probably will mean even though that say these books are destroyed in this, these examples, they'll be replaced um, by our bibliographers because it's a high usage item. So don't worry when you see this kinds of stuff. Will is going to uh, bring it home with some, solu some solutions for all of these things. Next slide. That's Will's turn. Oh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, so I guess I'm just going to wait for my slides to come up, and then I'll start talking. Um, OK, so uh, the title of my talk is Let's Talk About That Broken Book You'd Like Me to Look At. Um, so this talk is inspired by the many inquiries um, that are put to me privately, either by friends, work colleagues, or family about repairing a book in their possession that is broken, or is important, or is in need of some conservation advice. And next slide, please. Um, so the objective of this talk is in part to help make book repair conversations more productive and helpful for everyone. Um, this will help repair, uh, prepare interested individuals to share valuable information about their book that a conservator can't possibly know just by looking at the book itself. Um, there will also be some general good preservation advice for, uh, for the home that I'd like to share. Next slide, please. Um, and here are the areas I'd like to cover. Um, tell me more about your book. Um, if you're going to repair a book yourself with tape, and so you're thinking of working with a conservator, and preservation at home. Next slide, please. Um, so to get us started, let's look at some examples of book repair inquiries I harvested from the comment section of the Demco Idea and Inspiration blog. Uh, Demco, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a decades old manufacturer and retailer of school and library supplies, including a wide variety of products that help individuals and institutions mend and repair their books. So from the example you see here, um, the reasons people bring up to the table are pretty typical. Then an item is, um, has either intrinsic or extrinsic value to its owner. Um, but just as typical are the two blinking comments where the reason is the mere fact that a book is damaged or being told by one sibling that one will be killed if, if a borrowed book gets damaged. Next slide, please. Um, so tell me more about your book or why is this book important to you? Um, so this is how I imagine an, an ideal conversation would start before we talk about repairing or treating a book. Um, I've identified six main qualities or attributes uh, people experience and value in their favorite books. And I mean books as objects as well as carriers of information. Um, these are qualities shared by all books, but to varying degrees. So number one, um, books that are enjoyed or used frequently. Um, ex examples include a favorite book to read, a cookbook, a textbook, or a go-to reference book. Number two, books with sentimental value. Um, examples include book, um, uh, books that are gifts from family members or books that are reminders of life events, milestones, and relationships. Uh, a book with personal evidence such as inscriptions, marginalia, doodles, unique markings, alterations, and wear also becomes irreplaceable on top of being sentimental. Number three, books um, that are expensive or valuable. These include books you remember paying a lot for, which is subjective, or when you check a Libris and realize your book is worth a lot more than you thought, or a book you collect explicitly as a commodity to resell at a later time. This could also be college textbooks, which are known to cost a lot, and many people don't like the idea of discarding them. Number four, um, books that are rare or irreplaceable. Um, examples of rare and irre irreplaceable books overlaps with those with sentimental value, but it's really about that book that isn't commonly uh, commercially available anymore that may not have any particular personal connection to you. These can be um, ephemera such as pamphlets, trade journals, magazines, yearbooks, and catalogs. Number five, um, books that are beautiful or appealing. Um, so books in this category can be anything as beauty is in the eyes of, of the beholder, but I do want to point out that there are some books um, that are only value for their decorative spines. Um, for people who think of books as decor, sometimes a beautiful spine is the only thing that matters. So think Instagram images of gorgeous home libraries lined with expensive sets of old books or carefully curated stacks of coffee table books. 
um, number six, X Factor. So books in this category evokes a feeling that repairing it might be fun or, um, or sprucing up an old book is a nice, honorable thing to do. Um, next slide, please. Um, so to assess a book's value to its owner, for ease of use and for fun, I applied the six values to create this data chart, much like a data chart for a video game character, where they summarize the character's various qualities like agility, strength, and endurance. It's just a more succinct and visual way to represent your relationship to a book rather than asking you to check off a list or describe it in prose. So each of these attributes are scored on a one to five point scale, with one being a point on the smallest of the concentric hexagons and five a point on the largest and outermost hexagon. I've included a space to fill in the book's age on the chart just as one objective measurement to shade the assessment overall. Next slide. Um, and here is an example of the data chart as it is filled out. Um, I will be using two books from my personal collection as, a, as samples for this assessment exercise. Next slide. So this is the first of my books. It's a petite Japanese anime book from the 1980s. Um, so to mimic what I often hear when people bring a damaged book to me, I wrote, the pages threaten to pop out when I prop the book open. So this is quite often the first and only thing that's said to me when someone shows me their book. They just tell me what's wrong with the book, which I can already see. So this isn't especially useful information. So let's see what the charts tell us. Uh, next slide. So, so the chart shows a, com uh, shows a competition among three high scoring attributes. Um, the fact that this book is somewhat rare and sentimental to, uh, to most means it needs to be preserved and minimally used to prevent, the, uh, pre to prevent it from deteriorating further. Um, but the fact that it also is frequently used means it needs to mechanically function well as a book, by which I mean you should also be able to flip the, pa uh, flip to the pages without worrying about the pages popping out. But I know this book and I'm familiar with this kind of binding. It is an example of a combination of, of poor book design and poor material choices. Um, there are multiple fundamental problems with this book that cannot be changed, um, the worst of which is the incredibly thick and stiff pages. No amount of glue will keep the pages together as you crack the spine to open the pages fully. So what would a conservator recommend? We will recommend this at the end of the talk. Next slide. Um, this is the second of my books to be assessed. It's an English Chinese dictionary. Um, and here I wrote, this is the dictionary I used to look up words in English when I emigrated to America in 1984. Um, so the statement I gave here is a lot more meaningful as far as a personal, related, a personal relationship and history with the book. Obviously, between the internet and smartphones, this book is no longer useful to its owner, me, who also hasn't needed uh, an English Chinese dictionary for quite some time. Uh, next slide. Um, so it's no surprise that this book scores high, both in sentimental and wear slash irreplaceable. Um, there's one very important aspect of this book I need to mention. Um, I did the repairs on this book as a student assistant in the library back in 1989. I utilized book repair tape and repaired it with the techniques taught to me at the time. Um, you will see gum linen tape at the book's inner hinge, carefully trimmed as not to obscure the printed content on the, on the end papers. I also selected burgundy color repair tape to match the book's color. Um, the repairs held, held up, not because they're any good, but because the book is not used at all and is stored well on a bookshelf. All the tape and tape residue can be removed and the repair can be redone and done better with archival materials and the best conservation methods. So what would a conservator do with this? Again, we will revisit this at the end of the talk. Um, next slide. So let's talk quickly about tape um, from the perspective of a conservator. Um, you'll often see tape marketed as a means of preserving a, uh, or protecting a book, but it's a temporary fix um, at best and could become a nuisance if you later decide you'd like to have your book professionally conserved. Next slide. Um, for example, if you tape a loose page to an attached page, you effectively make them a heavier single unit, which will pull away from your book's binding in inevitably. This does not address the fundamental issue of your book's poor leaf attachment overall. For a conservator, tape on paper, as you see in the images here, are incredibly time consuming and difficult to remove and often with, with uh, mixed results. Um, next slide, please. 
Additionally, tape not only loses adhesion over time, but can strip whatever is attached to of detail, see um, image number five, and leave a nasty residue behind, see in image number three. Um, this often increases the work required to properly conserve a book where, the repair, uh, where repair is desired. So we usually need to remove tape in this residue and deal with damage that the tape itself caused. Incidentally, the tape used in pictures number three and five are the same as the tape I use on my old English Chinese dictionary. Next slide, please. So it seems like a big jump between repairing a book yourself with tape and working with a conservator, but I think it's a very appropriate transition. Um, next slide, please. To get us started, I want to clarify the conflation of the two terms, conservation versus restoration. Uh, quite often, a conservator's efforts are called restoration work, and a restorer's work is referred by some as conservation. There is a big difference, and I want to take a moment to clarify. Next slide, please. Restoration's primary goal is to make something look new, as if it were made yesterday. This usually takes the form of a, a very in, invasive intervention, removing and disposing of original artifacts and erasing evidence of use in history, all to achieve a recreation of a newly manufactured or produced object. The result is often a stunning transformation that delightfully evokes what the item might have once been but you only get a fraction of the original object back in your hand. The authenticity and aura of the original object is usually lost. The pair of photos you see here is an example of restoration. It's a very nice restoration of an old legal book uh, done by catered craft bookbinders here in Pico Rivera in Southern California. As stated on their website, the volume was rebound in the original style, but the original binding was not saved. Um, next slide, please. Um, different from restoration, conservation's first goal is to stabilize damage. The number one guiding principle is always to minimize artifact loss, so the result is not about aesthetics or making the book or object like new. Um, the pair of photos you see here are from a conservation treatment performed by UCLA's conservator, Chela Metzger, on an 18th century Hebrew prayer book in UCLA's library's, uh, UCLA's library special collections. You'll notice that the binding is not altered in any way, but the loose bits of covering material on the book has been consolidated and packed down, and the tattered leaves that, are, that poked out have been carefully mended, reinforced, and properly incorporated back into the text block. Next slide, please. Um, so what you don't see in the photos are the non-repair work that takes place before, during, and after conservation treatment. This involves an abundance of discussion, research, documentation, negotiation, and agreement among many interested parties, such as scholars, researchers, curators, and librarians, to make sure the book isn't altered in a way that compromises its original integrity and cultural context. This is one exam example of an institutional conservation treatment. Different from restorers, conservators will tend to consider a much broader range of treatments, depending in part on how you relate to and wish to use your book. There are three general options, which are not mutually exclusive that a conservator may consider. Next slide, please. One, box or enclose the book as is. Another way to say this is to do nothing other than to protect the book in its current state. Number two is to repair the book. And number three is to replace the book. Next slide, please. A subset of replacing the book for a book that remains commercially available might be to get a, a second copy for use either as an archive or working copy, depending on your attachment or relationship to your existing well-worn copy. Next slide. Um, whichever copy is the archive or the working copy is up to you. If a sentimental attachment informs you to preserve your well-used book in its current state, make it the archive copy. If you desire to have a pristine copy of the book in, per in perpetuity, just continue using your old one as the working copy. Next slide, please. Um, in lieu of conservation treatments on individual books, it is incumbent, incumbent on me to always pass along some simple advice on how best to keep the entirety of your collection in good shape. Um, this picture on the right is meant to illustrate catastrophic neglect of, of a collection of books. This does not have to happen. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the first and easiest thing to, for everyone to do is to keep your bookshelves tidy. Um, I'm calling it mindful bookshelf maintenance because to me, the antithesis of the mindful practice is a neglectful one. And the longevity of a personal collection very much depends on how well you pay attention to the way you store your materials. Next slide. Slumping and stacking is a form of benign neglect, but they put books in stress position for extended periods that quicken their, their deterioration a lot faster than one might think. It's important to always keep books in compression so they aren't vulnerable to gravity's pull. A roll full of slumping books is very hard on the hinges and joints of every single binding on that shelf. It distorts the spine and hastens the degradation of spine linings that keeps the book sturdy. Straightening, uh, straighten slumping books whenever you notice them and use a bookend to keep the entire row under pressure. Stacking books in and of itself is not damaging, but must be done with life-size books neatly and in relatively small and lightweight grouping so, so it's safe to retrieve a book without toppling the entire stack. Dusting is important as what, uh, what appears as dust could be an accumulation of mold spores which can bloom when environmental conditions are favorable to mold growth. Dust is also attractive to pests that eat books. Just the simple act of taking a dusty book out and using it helps it a great deal. Next slide please. So here are photos showing various shelving practices of home collections. In this instance, these are my bookshelves as well as those of my UCLA work colleagues, Hannah Mosher and Sheila Metzger. Um, in the bookcase on the left, you see most of my books are stacked. That's because many of my books are too tall to stand up inside these book cubbies. Um, but all these books are similar in size, so stacking them is on one hand an adaptive strategy to work with the space limitations, and on the other hand, a method to keep all of these books under compression. The stacks are also not outrageously high and are in a confined space. This makes it possible to take a single book out without risking toppling the entire stack. But in practice, when I want a book uh, at or near the bottom, I generally take most of the book off, um, uh, most of the books off above it to lighten the load and replace everything afterwards. Hannah organizes her books by color, which is aesthetically very pleasing but she also, also cleverly deploys weighted objects as bookends to keep her books in compression. There's also plenty of space above each row of books um, for access to dusting. Shayla organizes her books by subject, and this is a very heavily used reference collection of books on conservation. Shayla uses a combination of bookends for larger books and magazine files for thin paper objects. The upper row are of historic bookbinding models Shayla made with blank pages that she uses for teaching. There aren't technically books to be read, so we can forgive Chela a little bit for not adhering to the best shelving practices with the slumping and the lack of compression we see. Next slide, please. So maintain good and safe storage environments. Um, and then the easy way to think of this is if you're comfortable, your books will, will be comfortable too. Um, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity is an ideal environment for book storage, basically what's comfortable for most human beings. Too hot and dry causes books, uh, books to embrittle and crack, much like human skin. Next slide, please. Um, so these are ways things can go terribly wrong when you neglect the environments in which your books are stored. Mold damage can happen when the storage space is dark, poorly ventilated, and too warm and too humid. Hu uh, unfortunately, these four conditions exist in many home environments, such as closets, garages, attics, and basements. Water damage may result from storing books in areas with, poor, uh, with prior histories of leaks and flooding, especially when the leak sources have not been identified nor addressed. Dirt and dust are attracted to insects, so it's important to make sure storage areas where you keep your valuable collections are clean and well tended to. Next slide, please. So here are the ways at UCLA, um, here, here are the ways we at UCLA cope with damage to books from the conditions in the previous slide. Mold, if they're not active and wet, can be cleaned up by vacuuming and mechanical removal with cleaning pads. Water damage is first remediated by air drying and provided um, that the pages aren't stuck together and water didn't move too far into the text block. The, book, uh, the books can be rebound with the margins trimmed and the old cases replaced with new. Pest damage is typically managed by freezing books, except for leather bound books um, for up to three weeks to kill bugs and eggs. Afterwards, we thoroughly vacuum to rid the effective um, volume of eggs and insect bodies. Sadly, 
extreme cases in all three types of damage can often mean total loss to the book. And I have witnessed this more often than I care to acknowledge. Next slide, please. Um, I also want to bring your attention to paper objects in your collection that require a bit more care and proactive protection. These are items in your collection that are fragile or potentially vulnerable. We're going to talk about, so we're going to talk about enclosures. Um, the more common reason for closing a damage, uh, enclosing a damaged book or object is to minimize unnecessary handling and prevent abrasion and contact with, it, with adjacent materials. This we all understand, but I want to talk about something that is just as common, but less thought of. Not every paper-based object you have in your possession will have the dimension of an average book and can easily be mangled, crushed, buried, and worst of all, lost when you try to wedge them amongst your other books. Um, I'm talking about fragile, oddly shaped, thin and small items. In such cases, I recommend acquiring prefabricated, rigid enclosures to not only serve as a protective barrier, but also as an extension of the object's footprint to a more conventional size and shape so it can safely claim their spot on the shelf among other books. Next slide, please. As far as enclosures go, archival products, Hollinger, Metal Edge, and Gaylord are the three go-to vendors for UCLA. Um, so for archival enclosure options, number one is a four flap enclosure ideal for thin, small, and fragile materials. They come in many sizes to accommodate a wide variety of paper objects and books up to one inch thick. I find these um, some of the most useful um, and easy to deploy prefab enclosures for both personal and institutional collections. Number two is a document box for storing archival materials, such as personal papers and letters. Please notice the file folders that populate the document box. That's where individual or organized groups of papers and letters are kept. You can rifle through organized paper contents very easily this way. Number three and four are prefab box options from Gaylord, made from corrugated or laminated boards. They come in a few sizes that work for most average size books that are on the thicker and heavier side. Next slide. Um, you may also find useful containers, but not necessarily archival quality ones from retailers such as a container store in Staples. Um, they tend to only have a couple of sizes uh, and will likely be much larger than you need. The key to using these is to never overfill them or store heavy things in them. They're really only meant for storage of, of lightweight or delicate things. Uh, next slide. Um, so to bring us back to the two books we assessed from earlier in the presentation, I want to very quickly remind you of three possible options, box, repair, and replace. And now let's answer the question, what would a, cons what would, what would a conservator recommend? Next slide. So no repair for the sentimental English Chinese dictionary because its condition is stable, the old repairs aren't affecting the book in any way, and the book is not being used and the existing storage conditions are favorable for the books um, to continue to be in this state for a long time to come. And no repair and box for the anime book with the pages popping out. This book is just not a good candidate for any conventional repair methods. The thick, inflexible and glossy pages along with the narrow binding margin makes, the, uh, makes repair or rebinding a doomed proposition. The rigid pages are very sturdy, almost like playing cards. So provided that every page has a page number, which it does, this book can be used as a stack of loose papers without the fear of loss of sequencing. All this book requires is an appropriately sized box or enclosure and the habit of jogging the pages back into a neat deck before putting it um, in the enclosure and putting it away. This book will be protected while remaining usable and useful. Next slide, please. So I will leave you with images of some of my most treasured paper objects stored in boxes and containers. Incidentally, not all of which are archival quality. Um, a lot of the stuff you see here are reminders of the first years of my life in America. Um, I take these boxes out now and then, rummage through the contents and consider the prospect of uh, photographing or scanning every item. It may be fun to create something akin to an exhibit catalog with these. It will be like a biography of me, frozen in time, told in objects. Next slide, please. Um, but for now, everything has its place and I feel comfortable with where they live, somewhere safe, clean and dry, where I can re be, re be reunited with them whenever the mood strikes. Next slide, please. 
Um, so thank you for your time and, and your attention in watching Ram Metzen and my presentations. Hannah will now be helping us with questions. So over to you, Hannah. <laughs> Great, thank you, Will. Thank you. Uh, so the first question, um, can you talk about storing books on wooden bookcases, solid wood and particle board versus metal cases? Hmm, okay. Yeah. Um, the, I can think, okay, so for books in metal bookcases, the only thing I can think of is um, it's easy to clean um, if you notice the wet fast enough to wipe them off. Um, and solid wood is good, um, but also it's, you know, it's also like a carbon-based material. So it's this, the same as the way you will want to keep your books. You want to keep the area cool and dry and clean, all of those things. Um, and they're also susceptible to mold growth. So you really should think of them kind of, kind of like your, all your furniture, you know, keep them in, in good clean spaces um, and also free of moisture. So part, the only thing about part of what I don't like is that it warps. <laughs> um, and it's not as sturdy as um, bookshelves that are made with solid wood. As far as the way they, um, they interact with your books, I think a lot, a lot has to do again with your shelving practices. If you know your books, your bookcases are not sturdy, don't put really, really heavy books in it or, or don't fill it completely with books, you know, kind of space things out or just be kind of intelligent about where you place them. Um, and of course, um, heavier stuff on the bottom, lighter stuff on the top. Um, and if you notice wet, if you notice dirt, if you notice mold, get to it really fast. <laughs> and, and if there's mold on it, you can clean it. I, I think I couldn't get into it in the top very much, but you have to get to mold before it gets wet. By that, it literally means when you put your finger across it, it leaves um, literally a, like, like skid marks, like a trail. Um, dry mold is like powder, it's powdery. So you can actually vacuum it up and it's fine. But once it gets wet, it's really tricky. Yeah. Um, next question, any advice about silverfish? Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I have a lot of experience with silverfish. I think um, some of this, like keeping the conditions like cool and dry, dusting frequently. You can put out blunder traps if you like really want to know if you have like an infestation. Um, and if you do, then you can freeze the books as long as they're not bound in leather. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the same. Um, this has happened, well, and this is what we do is we bag them. We bag the, um, yeah. the, the books um, in uh, plastic bags um, so the insects can't, or the silverfish can't escape, so they die. <laughs> um, when you freeze them, yeah. When you freeze them, yeah, and for three weeks. Can I add? Can I add to the discussion too? Um, I think it's really important too, especially if you're in an area like, say, I used to live in Irvine when I was an undergrad, and we had tons of ants all the time. I couldn't afford um, getting a pest control type person. Now I'm older, I can. What I what I when I hear is a lot of times there'll be infestations. You know, be all well. Do you have a pest control type remediation uh, contract with somebody? And invariably say, no, we just let it expire. And, you know, we all do that. So I would definitely recommend if, like at my house here in Long Beach, uh, twice a year, especially because I have kids, they're afraid of spiders. I kind of am too a little bit. Twice a year, I have a, a pest person come out and they will treat, well, the children aren't here. They'll treat the inside. They'll treat the outside. Now, obviously, there's different kinds of chemicals and that you would have to research that on your own, but I highly recommend that as a kind of preventative measure. Um, Cause you don't like Will was saying, you don't want to be in a situation where the mold is actually active. And when it, when we say active mold, that means that it's chomping and eating your materials, right? So we want to catch everything, you know, if we can as a preventative, as opposed to, Oh no, my hair's on fire. We have to do this all now. And then all sorts of things can arise at that time. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> Um, next question, do you have any suggestions for the best way to handle a book while scanning on a flatbed scanner? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Yeah. I, well, I don't know. I want to, uh, Ron, you want to take it first? Not, I'm going to dance. Yeah, I can take and then you can add or, or uh, say that I said things that are wrong. But, you know, being that I graduated in um, 95, back when everything was flatbed, scan, flatbed copy machines. Now we have these nice book cradles where everything, you know, the scanner will like shine on here and then you can just turn the pages. The big thing I was saying like earlier is you don't want to cram you know i'm going to turn this upside down you don't want to smash it in there because you know you need to get this your margins are tight or whatever like that it could be a situation where you're going to um not want to use a flatbed scanner or if you do it's possible uh, now that i'm just kind of brainstorming when i used to do this what i would do instead of doing completely flat like i am here i would actually find you know if i could i would change my margins on my scanner and i would kind of let part of the text locker book drape over the edge say like this of the scanner because the scanners are usually only like three or four, four inches uh you know wide or tall or whatever you're thinking instead of we just you don't want to be here and then if you're in a situation where you have tight margins like my mom's cookbook right here um maybe will or hannah could could add to that conversation and i can learn something too in this discussion <laughs> what would you do with tight margins um well, I mean, this is the thing is, um, it depends on what outcome you want. So for me, you know, really taking a photo of it with your phone is quite good enough. Um, right. I mean, there, if you want a pristine scan, a pristine image that has no shadow, no distortion, then um, um, even putting in a flatbed scanner is not ideal. I mean, there are scanners um, that we've seen at UCLA that has glass, basically, they come in at a... Um, at a, like a maybe like a 90 degree angle that comes down like this you know so and they take pictures this way and this way but that's a commercial scanner but i think for most people if you're only interested in information use your phone just um have the book open on the table uh, provided that they will lie flat um and take a picture with your phone so you're not really um or, uh, damaging the book and you're getting the information you want um and you know if you are resourceful and feel like doing it, you can maybe find a surrogate online of a book that already is out there that you can see. <laughs> so um, I, I send people to the surrogate option all the time. But, but um, I would say um, what I have done also is um, take pictures with my phone. I, I find that pretty satisfactory. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What do you say to a person who licks their finger before turning every page in your book? Ew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ron, you want to take out? Um, I would just say, you know, best, you know, obviously you don't want to be, I never appreciated people coming up to me when I was uh, cutting my teeth in the profession, this whole, ah, what are you doing? Don't do it. Yeah. Make you paranoid. But you, you want to get, you know, we'll call it gentle reminders. Like, Hey, what you're doing is you're introducing uh, oil, like I said, uh, salt to uh, the paper itself, which could possibly you're introducing maybe some mold or whatever. In that instance, um, you, you, you basically you would want a gentle reminder with you know this is why you, sh you know you probably shouldn't be doing this because this will result in in and you know, bleeding of uh, onto the paper with wherever you did that. I, I can't believe people are still doing it, but that's, people do it, you know, what are you gonna oh, do? Oh, I can imagine. I mean, it's sometimes you just don't have that traction you want. You right. Know? So, um, I mean, I think there's like, that question has two sides, right? Are we talking about this for the good of the book or the good of the person, right? So, uh, so for the good of the book, which is what Ron, you just had, you had just talked about, like my problem really is with people like really pinching the book and they make a crease, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and I mean, and I know the whole kind of uh, issue with um, people really trying to flip a book and they just can't do it. Um, so it, 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 so don't do it is, 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 is what I'm trying to tell you. But um, the, the reasons are it's, uh, it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's, but you, there's, there are other things you can do. You can blow the page over. I don't really know. I also or, think like, it's easy to say right now, like, you know, you're you're going to spread germs if you do that. And that's like a, right. a way to be like, please don't, you know, yeah. before using my book. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, and, so and that, that would be for the benefit of the person, the human yeah, being. Exactly. You know, and right. So. And, and I think just too, um, 
I'm not going to, it's just uh, what we, we said, my, we're using the word mindfulness more these days, right? And what that is, is the person's in kind of their own rote learning where they've done that, done that. But if really, if you take the time, you can, you can take, just you op gently open your book. It takes a millisecond more and you just find that page and you just kind of curl it and you gently turn it and then you can kind of do open a little more and then do your turning. But the other one is you're trying to get to that page super fast and you know what? It's just going to take you a second or two longer if you just do it, do it the ways that we're talking about it to turn yeah. the page. And, and I think Ron and I talked about like the purpose of us talking to everybody about their books and caring for their books. I think ultimately we want you to enjoy your book. Yes. You know, if it's your book and you love it and use it a lot, you lick your finger and you flip those pages. Yeah. Go ahead and do that. You know, it's totally fine. And, and you know, I'm going to throw in a quick little anecdote. When I first started working at UCI, you know, and I say this, one of my mottos is that every day I see something new at work. And we got, we had a um, physician over at the teaching medical school saying, hey, I have a bunch of my textbooks. We need, we need you to bind. We need, I need it bound. I use these in class. Da, 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 da. Like, oh, okay. So we sent over two boxes full of all of these, um, uh, you know, biology books or whatever. And first thing we noticed was a terrible smell. Like, oh no, I've never smelt that smell before. Well, we opened it up and he actually was using all these books as his, in his cadaver classes. And he had formaldehyde all over the books and he was paging through them. But for some reason for him, he didn't, he neglected to tell us that thing, that little caveat, which was massive because we couldn't do anything about his situation. Um, but you know, that's an example of him using his books and he enjoyed them and he liked them for class. And like Will said, in, in, and he was just hoping that we could just bind them and there wouldn't be any problem with the cadaver juice as we called it. And, um, you know, it was just a funny anecdote that I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, next question. What is the best way to decontaminate books from free little libraries or the public library? as related to our current COVID pandemic. I use the BH Library curbside and two free little libraries. Many thanks, great presentation. So- uh, Well, yeah, you, we, we actually posted this in our, on our website, so- um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, yeah well, Which ahead. website did we post it on, LabNet or UCLA? Oh, I'm thinking, no, no, it's, it's not our website, it's our conference page. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we'll put that yeah, on the public. But but. What UCLA is doing anyways is you just, set them aside for, I think we're doing 72, 72 hours. 72 hours, yeah. Yeah, because um, there have been studies that show that on um, library materials, the amount of virus really is like negligible by the third day. Um, and you really don't want to like spray the books with anything that could damage them. Um, so, so. Oh, well, there's some microwave ones here. We actually, yeah, I'm sorry, Anna. No, um, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, we actually made a little flyer that we insert um, into books that we are doing interlibrary loans with to let people know not to spray it because it would damage, it would, um, it's not, it's, it's, it'll damage the books. And also to not put uh, books in the microwave, which um, will, because there are metal components in some books, ah. the, the books will, caught, will catch fire. Or so. they would have the tattle tape if it were say a, a, a library book, yeah. you would have tattle tape that would explode. <laughs> Exactly. So, so no spray and no, no, uh, no microwave, but I mean, just wait uh, 72 hours. Yeah. Um, and then I just wanted to answer one quick question. Someone asked, um, are silverfish bad and what do they do for uh, books slash paper? Um, so yeah, silverfish can be bad for books. Um, they can eat the, the paper. They will, they will actually eat through it. And they love to just die right in the middle of the book and leave all their, you know, they just, that's it. That's like their little coffin. Yeah. <laughs> little rascals. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you to uh, LA as Subject for hosting this. And um, if you want to learn more about uh, LAPNET, you can find us at lapnet.org. And of course, thank you to Will and Ron. All right.